I do think that our society is going on a, a poor trajectory because nobody does get checked. Nobody does get punched in the fucking mouth. So now you think it's okay to cut people off and flip them off. But if you assign yourself that duty and responsibility to try and correct that, you're only gonna end up in trouble. I'm deploying to Ramadi and that's right when the Blackwater guys got hung from the bridge. Just so you know, it's not if, it's when here, but we get hit all the fucking time. And then shit, man. Like every run, ambushed, ID'd, literally getting hammered by indirect, like almost 24-7. Yeah. People listening are probably like, what the fuck were you guys even doing? And I can tell you, we got shot at probably an equal amount from US troops as we did the insurgency. It was fucking dicey for a while. Cause it's like, not only are we in a hornet's nest, but my gun only works about 50% of the time. Welcome to Mic Drop, the podcast where relevancy is irrelevant and we don't give a shit about your feelings. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, it's both an honor and a pleasure to welcome my next guest to the podcast. He spent five years in the U.S. Army as a ranger and then an additional five years at Triple Canopy as a contractor and then another five years with the U.S. Marshals and then three and a half years as an active law enforcement officer with the Port of Seattle. He is the co-host of the Endless Endeavor podcast. He's the owner of Electric North Jiu-Jitsu, which is a checkmat affiliate. Uh, he also owns his own laundromat in that he folds clothes while people are still wearing them. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage, Greg Anderson. Hey, thanks for having me, man. I know we've been talking about this for a while and yeah. finally made it happen, so this is yeah. cool. No, I, pr I appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, I mean, I remember... I, I didn't know you uh, or, or know of you prior to when everything went down, when that kind of the viral moment, if you will, of you, the, I guess the reason that you got fired, which we'll certainly get into yeah. but, uh, ever since then, I was like, man, I got to get that fucking dude on the podcast. So you want to hear something funny? Yeah. I don't know if you've put this together or not yet, but we actually did know each other before really? that viral video. Really? I was in the process of getting a dog from you. No shit. Because Seth Farewell was one of my best friends. Oh, okay. Well, fucking A, man. Yeah, so I was, me and my wife, I had a Malinois for 14 years, and we ended up putting him down. Yeah. And uh, my wife wanted another Mal or a Dutchie. Okay. And, and Seth was like, bro, one of my friends has the yeah. best, the best fucking dog <laughs> you've ever seen. I think his name was Draco or Drago. Do you remember that dog? Uh, it was a big. Oh, Digo, maybe. Digo. Yeah, big, probably. strong uh, Dutchie. Yeah, fuck. I mean, it, it escapes my memory, but uh, so, anyways, you, you imitate Seth perfectly. <laughs> yeah, man, I miss that guy every day. I um, so, I mean, I have three small daughters, right? Now they are they are eight, eleven, and fourteen. But this was, you know, three or four years ago when we were yeah. talking. And Seth goes, bro, listen, I'm going to put you in contact with Mike. Tell him you don't have kids. Okay. <laughs> I said, what do you, so lie to him? What do you mean? Seth. He goes, dude, just fucking listen to me. I went down there. I played with this dog. It's a good fucking dog. I said, Seth, you're 240 pounds. I have a six-year-old daughter. Yeah. Dude, it, trust me. This dog will <laughs> like your fucking kids. Trust me. Tell Mike you don't have kids. So we did. We started going back and forth. Oh, I don't remember if it was email or if we did. No, we did a conference call. Oh, shit. And you asked if there was kids in the house. I okay. said, yes. And you said, well, this is not a dog for kids. What are we? Yeah. He goes, uh, and you were like, I'm sorry. This is, yeah, this isn't going to work out. Yeah. And, I, and Seth was like, I told you to tell him you didn't. And I was like, well, Mike's the expert. Yeah, I'm not going to fucking lie to him. Like if he wants to yeah. <laughs> know my household dynamics before he sends me a dog. Yeah. And so we ended up not going through with that. But I, well, that was a classic Seth story, man. I, I Don't I feel like an asshole then? I, uh, I, I will say like not just that conversation i've had probably thousands of times at this point with, of course with people, but but also even through seth i've had probably dozens of of th that exact same scenario like dude i got this buddy of mine he want, he's perfect for a dog you want you know like we went, i went through that with him i don't know how many fucking times you know, yeah so, no dude uh, don't apologize yeah. i i uh you know as a owner of a jiu-jitsu academy it's like a revolving door yeah. we have our base of people that are yeah. are always there but people come and visit and cross train and I'll have a guy that'll stop by and I'll introduce myself. He's like, bro, we used to train together. Yeah. And it's like, I'm sorry, man. But it's like, yeah. you only have the capacity yeah. to know so many people, no, I know you know? That. Yeah. That's a, uh, that's wild shit, man. Yeah. Seth, uh, I, I want, I mean, now that, 
um, now that I'm thinking about it, he the process from when he started jujitsu until he got his black belt was exceptionally short, right? Exceptionally like five short. years. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he was but training he, twice a day, and you know, he's like, he's just one of those guys. Like people will say, like size and strength don't matter in jujitsu, and it's like athleticism absolutely matters yeah. in jujitsu. Yeah. And Seth was the best athlete I've ever known. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I went through buds with him, and uh, the shit that he did in, in SEAL training like didn't make sense. You know? <laughs> Dude. Well, so for listeners to be able to conceptualize what we're talking about, Seth was 230 pounds at like 5% body fat. Yeah. He could run a 436 mile and cling and jerk 350. Yeah. And, I well, mean, it's just, just absolutely absurd yeah, athlete. Yeah. I mean, yeah, 100% there with you. And, and the, the mile thing too, like not just a mile, like he could run six sub, yeah, yeah. sub five minute miles in a row as know? a big human. Yeah. Like, I mean, he did the fucking ultra marathons and I mean, fuck, we lived together, uh, for a period of time. Um, like it was, it was a guy that I was in a platoon with and there were four or five of us and it was in San Diego state, uh, the college area in San Diego. And, uh, <clears throat> the fucking stories from that guy, like he would eat, I mean, like a fucking, like Garfield. I mean, it was just like, <laughs> yeah. like, but it, every morning you'd get up and you go in the kitchen and there'd be some fucking surprise. Like there, there's an industrial sized jar of peanut butter that's now gone that he ate last night or a fucking large pizza that has all of the toppings removed. <laughs> yeah, and it's true. just the fucking bread put back in the pizza. Did, the, uh, did Johnny Satella live with you guys then too? No. Because Johnny has tell, told me these exact same yeah. stories. I mean, I'm, I'm sure they live together, but uh I mean, sometimes there'd be fucking spaghetti sauce on the ceiling, you know, just like every fucking morning it was, it was some crazy shit that he had gotten into at two in the morning or whatever. And, and bro, he still did that up until the end, man. Like, yeah. uh, I visited him in Louisiana when, uh, he was instructing for triple canopy. Yeah. Is that how you guys met? Uh, we met through triple yeah. canopy deployed. Yeah. yeah. He was in Baghdad and I was stationed in Ramadi, but we would always bounce back and forth. Yeah. And, uh. Yeah, he was up in the middle of the night eating a whole block of cheese. Yeah. It, it has zero carbohydrates in it. <laughs> you're like, okay, so <laughs> you're also not going to shit right for a week. Yeah. We were at, at Nyland. Uh, have you been to Nyland, the, the Desert Warfare Training no. Facility for, for Naval Special Warfare? It's out in Eastern California in, in the Chocolate Mountains. And uh, I don't even know where the fuck he got it, nor would I trust it. But we're out there in like August. It's like 125 fucking degrees. And uh, I come in from, you know, we were doing something and we were doing this big joint thing out there. And uh, he's got probably a three pound piece of fucking ahi tuna raw <laughs> eating it, you know, like not even sushi grade, like just a big fucking yeah. chunk of, of raw, raw fucking fish. And I'm like, dude, we're in the middle of the fucking desert in August. There's no way you got that from somewhere that's anywhere that you'd, you'd want to trust. And you're eating it fucking raw. <laughs> Bro, I'll be fucking fine, yeah, dude. I mean, just like he was a walking fucking cartoon character. Man, <laughs> man I miss that guy. I know. All right. Hey, guys, I want to take a, a second to talk about ads. Um, and this is not an ad. This is me talking about the ads. I know that, um, you know, sometimes we get comments of, of people bitching about the ads. There's too many ads or they're too long or what have you. And I, I want to clear two things up, which is number one is that my slash our team's ability to bring you guests and, and bring them in and, and the accommodations and, and the entire process that it takes to produce these shows to the level with which we do uh, requires funding, you know, and the, the sponsors give us an ability to bring these shows to you. So while I understand that everybody wants zero ads and, and everything bunched together and, and what have you, this is how we, we bring this show to you. Uh, you know, we're a very small team. We're very fortunate to, to be able to do it. Uh, but we do still have to uh, to pay bills and, and bring that to you. So keep that in mind. That's the first point. And the second point is that I can assure you with 100% accuracy is that there is not a sponsor or a product that I talk about on here that isn't something that I use, okay, that, that I either regularly use or always use or have used. And, and I refuse to budge on that, okay? So we, we get... Uh, offers for for sponsors regularly that, that get turned down because it's not stuff that I use or would use. So keep that in mind. Uh, have a little bit of flexibility in terms of our ads and, and realize that they're products that I believe in, that I stand behind, and they're what, what make this show possible. So if you support these advertisers, these sponsors, that is supporting the show. Thank you.
What are the two key components for canine success? That's effective training and proper nutrition. Fueled by Team Dog brings those two components to your family and best friend. The perfect nutritional balance that results in a higher mental acuity, energy, overall vitality, and even an improved appearance. Every product you will find in my company's store was born from the battlefield and not from the boardroom. Let my life's work help you become your dog's hero. What's your most humbling jujitsu story? So my most humbling jujitsu story is also another Navy SEAL story. Um, do you know Dallas Dalton by chance? I don't. Okay. He, Sounds like a porn star. He, <laughs> yeah, I know, right? He, he was so cool that his call sign was actually just his first name. Oh, no shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, he was, a, he was a SEAL and, and I was a ranger and we started contracting together in Ramadi in 04. And, you know, in special operations, you dabble in jujitsu. And at Second Ranger Battalion, I learned, you know, what a rear naked choke and an arm bar was. And then we would just have platoon fights and I was pretty good, just naturally pretty good at jujitsu. So I thought I, you know, I got this. And then when, when I was deployed with Dallas, he goes, hey man, do you wanna to train tonight? I was like, yeah, what do you do? He goes, I'm a purple belt in jujitsu and a Muay Thai fighter. I was like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> and uh, so we go to this mat room that we built, cause you know, every deployment, you, you yeah. build a mat room somewhere. Fight club. And, and this dude, and I was 220 at the time and Dallas was 170. But he was like a George St. Pierre 170, yeah. like super athlete. And he beat the brakes off me. Oh shit. And I was just like, I, I didn't know that another man could do that to me. No shit. And it was that, that was the moment when it's like, okay, everything that I thought about fitness and getting strong and, and the gym and fucking people up, it's like, you thought you were a good fighter because you got in a bunch of dumb, drunken fights with college kids while you were a ranger. Yeah. As soon as you tangle with a dude that knew how to fight, I was helpless. Yeah. And so from that moment forward, I said, Dallas, we're training together every single night while I'm here. Yeah. And then I came home and joined a couple of different gyms and just immersed myself in it. Yeah. What, what year was that? It was 2004. Four. Yeah. Man, that's wild. Uh, do you have any idea what he's doing now? Do you keep in touch with him? Uh, no, I don't. I know uh, we have some mutual friends that'll cross paths every once in a while and, you know, give a little shout out, but I haven't stayed in touch. Yeah. Um, it sounds like an interesting fucking dude. For what sure. about what about Mike McGinnis? Do you know that name by chance? Uh, the name rings a bell, but I don't know. He him. was another team guy that uh, he was a brown belt at the time, and he was also on that deployment. So as soon as I realized what this jujitsu stuff was, I was yeah. grabbing him all the time too. And We're, then and then like so many of our guys, like multiple deployments to Ramadi, and then Mike was killed in a car crash in in between deployments. It's, Fuck, man. Now, yeah, now I know who you're talking about. Okay. Yeah. Fuck, man. Yeah, yeah. That rings a, a whole whole series of bells. Uh, were they all training out of the West Coast under uh, from Victory or what? Do you know where they were? No, they were East Coast guys. Oh, really? <clears throat> yeah, I'm not sure. I know Mike was post posthumously promoted to black belt oh, at okay. his funeral. Yeah, that's. But cool. yeah, they were East Coast guys. Yeah. Uh, what is your favorite submission? And you can't say it depends. Oh, there is no depends. I'm yeah. a one trick pony. Really? I'm an armbar guy. No shit. 100%. I even joke that after 20 years of jujitsu, uh, you know, I'm coming up on nine years at black belt that my chokes are really just, uh, you know, segues into yeah, exactly. armbar. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Traps into armbar. Yeah. And oh, you know, I, I, I geek out on jujitsu because there's, there is no right or wrong path Yeah. because you got guys like Hodger Gracie, who is really a, a one or two trick pony. He's going to take your arm or he's going to cross collar choke you from out. Yeah. And he does, but he does it to every single person that he touches. Yeah. And then you got other guys like the Mendez brothers that have an encyclopedia of jujitsu available to them in real time. And they're also high level world champions. Yeah. So there is no right or wrong path. You just have to figure out what works for you. Yeah. And I'm more of a, I enjoy getting very, very good and dominant at the basics as opposed to like always reinventing myself with like, cause jujitsu is always evolving. There's always like new tips and tricks that are coming down the pipe. And uh, I enjoy staying more old school and just passing guard, staying heavy and then hunting arms. Yeah. Is, is uh, 
in terms of the arm bar from a setup, and I don't want to geek out too much. I know, I know Dude, that people like jiu jitsu episodes, but, uh, but the uh, is there a, a certain position that you like it from or from anywhere? No, my favorite place to find the arm bar that I find is the hardest for people to defend is from side control. You hunt the far side, far side arm with an underhook and you pull that arm up. So now that arm's facing towards the ceiling. And then you spin around the head and capture the arm that way with the far side arm bar. Okay. It also sets it right up into Kimura trap if you want to go there. Yeah. So a lot of times I'll use that far side arm bar to go into Kimura trap. And then you can either Kimura or you can go into arm bar from there. Yeah. But like once you really learn some little pressure tips and some control points from that position, even when people know it's coming, they can't stop it. Yeah. And that's my favorite. Yeah. When people know what you're going to do to them and they still can't defend it. Yeah. That's when you know your shit's coming together. Yeah. yeah that's awesome. I mean, to me, it, it, it's kind of reminiscent of why so many of the Dagestani guys are so good in MMA is, is that they've mastered the very basic shit, but they're so good at it yep. that even high level guy, like a, I mean, to, to see uh, Islam get a fucking head and arm choke on Charles exactly like, who's the submission i yeah. think charles has the most submission yeah. wins in the ufc yeah and he's i mean a master he, he's built for it he's obvious like his pedigree is second to none and islam did it almost like a fucking black belt messing with a blue belt yep. like just like it was nothing you know and and it was quick too you know and it's just like i think the dagestanis have kind of mastered the the combination of great technique but instead of doing things with finesse, they do a lot of stuff with grit. Yeah. And that's kind of anti jujitsu. Yeah. Because a lot of jujitsu guys, it's it's kind of flowing. And, and once you come at people with like that tremendous amount of pressure. Yeah. And like I, I actually call it in my academy, Khabibing the hips. Yeah. Because he just clamps on the hips and pins your hips to the mat. And then you see it in people's eyes. He's yeah. breaking them because he just absolutely shuts down mobility. Yeah. Yeah, and, and and their their pace is just fucking relentless. Yeah, too, you know? like I mean, fuck, dude, dude, Khabib. I'm sure you've seen the videos. He's been grappling bears yeah. since he was four. Yeah, like <laughs> he just can't make up for that. Yeah, you know? I mean, you, you can see the like the hip strength uh, disparity between him and and Islam. I, mean, I, I think he's better than Islam, but I think so too. Um, I think Islam's maybe a little more technically savvy, but but Khabib is is in a different category, mental toughness and and yeah. the, like true natural aggression and and anger and and wanting to fucking hurt people. Like you can just <laughs> see it in him. Yeah, like he just has soulless fucking evil eyes. That, like when like when when he's in the in the ring like he just looks fucking evil yeah you know? like, and he fights like he's evil similar with cosmo to my yeah, like, yeah. Just like there's just something different about him. something different yeah. about him although i will say gilbert fucking to, to me uh tested or, or checked that dude's fucking oil way more than i would have expected which was awesome yeah and and i think cosmo would probably say the same thing yeah because before that, I think he had, what, six fights or something where he didn't even get hit? Yeah, I mean, he was just walking <laughs> through everybody. I mean, kind of similar with Islam up until he ran into Volkanovsky. Yeah. Kind of similarly, uh, you know. And, and that's, to me, that's where I would I would separate Kamzat and Islam from Khabib is that you never saw anybody really test Khabib. I mean, yeah. um, Al, Al Iaquinta was probably the closest, mm -hmm. but I think that that was kind of a fluke because it was a you know two week notice Last or whatever, switch or know, whatever. So, that's right uh but but e either way like he still didn't test him the way anybody else yeah uh, i mean no nobody has tested that guy the way that uh you know connor gave him probably one of his tougher fights yeah. too which was yeah. kind of i didn't see it going that way yeah. i thought khabib was going to molest connor yeah and uh and I, that's not even saying anything negative about connor it's just styles make fights yeah. and uh i was surprised yeah. but ultimately we exactly what i thought would happen ended up happening it just took a while yeah because i think it was like the end of round four was it i, I thought, think fuck i thought it was the second round i could be wrong but uh yeah i mean it was it was closer than i thought it would be too but uh yeah fucking fascinating shit i wish i wish that he hadn't retired but uh but i get it you know um what uh what is the and we'll, i'm sure we'll we'll weave some more uh, jujitsu stuff in here but uh for the sake of not having a, a nine hour podcast <laughs> uh, what's the uh, the last full book that you've read oh man um emotional intelligence 2.0 who's that by i i don't know that i don't remember the author's name off yeah. the top of my head i did for sell a 75 hard program because mm -hmm. reading for me has always been something that if i don't prioritize it and i don't stay disciplined 
it just goes on the back burner. And then before I know it, it's been a year since I've read a book. Yeah. And everybody will tell you the most successful people in the world consistently read a lot. Yeah. And so on Does penthouse letters count. <laughs> yeah. Cause I'm reading all the fucking yeah. time. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, when I was on 75, I read obviously a decent amount and it's only 10 pages a day, but you start burning through books at 10 pages yeah. a day. You don't realize like how much you can accumulate just doing 10 pages a day. Yeah. And, uh, but his standard is it's like, it's all nonfiction. So it has to be things that are not necessarily self-help, but things that are going to, improve your life in some capacity. Yeah. And it was weird because I was traveling somewhere and I'd forgotten. I was, I think I was reading, uh, I think it was Cam Haynes book, but I'd forgotten it at home. And then I got to the airport and I was like, fuck dude, I don't have my book. Well, I'm not going to fail because I'm traveling. And I walked into Hudson news and that was the first book on the shelf. Oh shit. I just grabbed it cause I was running a little late yeah. and then it ended up being one of the one of the most interesting books I've ever read. That's awesome. Because the whole thing about that emotional intelligence is recognizing your emotions and then allowing yourself the opportunity to have more of a choice in how you react as opposed to reacting emotionally. Yeah. And it's like road rage issues and just people being fucking idiots to you. Yeah. Things that would normally just set me off as like, Oh, I'm, I'm not in control of my life if I'm not in control of my emotions. And, uh, I learned a lot from that book. Yeah. So I r always recommend that one. That's awesome. I, um, have you found that, uh, that that's stuck with you? Cause a lot of times, like I'll read books that for a brief period, it's like, Oh yeah, let me implement this. And then it just kind of, kind of fizzles out. I like, would say that like, obviously right out of the gates, I was like, this is the new me. I, I'm good now. <laughs> it's you fucking know? ayahuasca and, uh, <laughs> in a book. Well, and I went and did ayahuasca. We yeah. talk about that yeah. too. Um, but yeah, you know, as time goes on, there's more, there's an ebb and flow to it, yeah. but I'll revisit it in my head too. Yeah. You know, if I find myself like literally, this was like a couple months ago, me and my, I was driving my 11 year old to school and I came up to a four way intersection and I'm clearly had the right of way. It wasn't one of those like, oh, hey, who's first? You know, yeah. I was there like a couple seconds before. And as I start to go, this other dude drives in front of me and, and pauses for just a second enough to flip me off. And it's like, listen, I'm not, I get it. If I do something fucked up and you want to flip me off, I can own that. You cut me off and you flip me off. Yeah. So it's to the death now. <laughs> and I started, I started like, I was going left and I, I turned right and I started going after him. And I was like, you got your fucking 11 year old in the back seat. Yeah. Dummy. What are you doing? You're a 42 year old man driving an 11 year old girl to school and you're going to purposefully interject yourself into a conflict. Knock it off. Yeah. And turned around and was like, Hey, I'm proud of you. Yeah. You just displayed some emotional intelligence. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, that's a, uh I mean, that's a great point, and I uh, I had a really interesting conversation uh, about that. Um, you know, from from my standpoint, the like the the big kind of takeaway or or principle, I guess, that I would apply with that is that uh, like you've got to look at the the big picture or the long game. You yeah. Know? In, in that, like, if you're in a situation where like there's no two ways about it or there's no way around it, then yeah, like do what you have to do, but to me, that that's the only time you should ever for sure. do anything like that. I, I was searching for the the name of the guest, Bill Rapier. I had him on a couple of years ago, and because he, you know, he in terms of living the warrior lifestyle is, is among the the most hardline of of anybody I've met, even in the circle of you know dedicated men that that you and I both know. And uh, I mean, he he lives it, breathes it, you know, lives off the grid, fucking does. 30 mile fucking hikes in the snow every morning with his kids. I mean, like he's just, he's crazy. He's been doing jujitsu since he was, since like 95. And I mean, he just knife fights. And I mean, have you met him? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. You, you should, I mean, he's up in, in your area. He's up in uh, Idaho, Montana. Okay. Area, but, um, just, uh, you know, consummate textbook fucking warrior lifestyle. And, and I was asking him about, it. I was like, you know, you got, he's got like four or five kids and, He's like, if you're out somewhere and, and somebody's fucking with you, how, how do you deal with it? And he's like, I always walk away. It's like, I don't even argue with you. Like, even if they're disrespectful, like the, the only time I'm going to do anything is if somebody grabs a hold of me and I have no choice. He said that then, and it's going to be ruthless and, and whatever. But outside of that, he's like, what, what benefit am I going to get other than my ego 
yeah by by doing anything like it's a lose lose you yeah. know because i don't know if they have a knife or a gun or 30 friends or somebody in a vehicle that's going to try to run me over or let's say that you know i do what i have to do and you end up killing the guy and i go to jail for the rest of my life exactly. or whatever like and now my kids don't have a dad my wife doesn't have a provider like what what's the fucking point in any of that nothing he's like so for me it's really easy to walk away and i you know I wouldn't say that I didn't look at it that way, but never, never to that degree where, you know, it very, I would say it resonated with me uh, significantly hearing him say it just cause you know, he's one of the baddest fucking dudes I've ever met, you know, and, and, uh, and, but you know, we'll, we'll avoid conflict like the fucking plague. You yeah. Know? It's like, to me, that's, that's just a smart way to go about it. But well, and also, I mean, you touched on it, like the likelihood of you getting in trouble and this is a, a flaw in our society, but you have to operate in the battle space that you occupy and the rules that we live under. Yeah. Because the, the opposite side of this is I do think that our society is going on a, a poor trajectory because nobody does get checked. Yeah. Nobody does get punched in the fucking mouth. Mm -hmm. So now you think it's okay to cut people off and flip them off, yeah. right? But if you assign yourself that duty and responsibility to try and correct that, you're only going to end up in trouble. Yeah. So. Especially, you know, anybody with a background like ours, like it, it's always going to go against you. Like of course. You do anything. I mean, you, you see it in the New York subway, like dude who's a Marine trying to interject and yep. now he's being charged with fucking murder. I know, you know it's man. like, it's crazy. I mean, some of that is, is a, a tragedy, I think in terms of the technique used to, to do it. Like yep. I, I wish he had been a little more savvy. Well, in, ground, ground fighting. I've wise. detained, you know, I had a guy breaking into my house one night and I was a blue belt at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was outside and I, I went out the back door, pied around the garage. I had my AR-15 and I could, it was very clear to me that he was high on something and he was out of his mind, right? So in Washington state, you shoot someone on your front porch, it's gonna be a problem, yeah. you know? And just like you just said, with our background and our my proficiency and firearms and stuff, like. You're a trained killer. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, so once I confronted him, he, he backed off the porch and then he was in my front lawn, but he was still yelling at me, fuck you and all this stuff. And so I handed my rifle off to the, the girl that was living with me at the time and said, go inside, call the police. And this was my first time using jujitsu in a real world application. No oh, shit. I had an arm drag, spun him, rear naked choke, unconscious in three seconds. Oh, shit. And I was like, oh. like I was surprised at how fast the guy went out. Yeah. But then I sat down on the ground behind him, put both my hooks in, and then let the choke. I didn't take the choke off. I just released the pressure of the choke. Yeah. And obviously, because you hold the choke for 10 minutes, you're going to kill him. Yeah. You know? And uh, yeah, unfortunately, the guy on the train just applied too much pressure yeah. for too long. But the thing is that fucking dude has been arrested 44 oh, times. I I, yeah, he's I mean, a he's... menace to society. And, and this is what I say to all of the fucking political elite people that want to like cast stones. It's like, if you don't do your fucking job and provide a, a, a safe environment for our citizens to fucking go about their daily lives in, don't be surprised when people that don't have the skill set or the ability to do the right thing, start interjecting themselves. Yeah. And nobody and, else is because nobody else is and you got psychopaths being confrontational with people on trains there's going to be a confrontation and oh it, it ended poorly surprise yeah i know you know that's a fucking travesty i mean he shouldn't have ever been put in that position i hope uh, that guy walks yeah. i gave i gave him i donated to his gofundme oh no shit <laughs> yeah yeah I actually give send go because oh, okay. GoFundMe yeah. went super woke oh and i know like it. yeah they're fucking shutting accounts down that they don't agree with yeah fucking that's terrible um what is your favorite childhood memory? Oh, you know what? One of my favorite childhood memories, and it's funny because at the time, I hated it. But looking back on it, it, it was one of the most like formative things in my youth was my dad was a commercial fisherman. And so every spring, he would take his boat from Everett, Washington up to Sitka, Alaska, up the Inside Passage. And I'd make that trip with him. And so he'd pull me out of school and like, late April, early May, and we would make the trip, father and son, and sometimes my mom and my sister would be with us too, go up the inside passage and then fish all summer. Wow. And as a little boy, you're like, oh, I'm not gonna see my friends for four months. Yeah. I don't get to finish school, you know? But then it's like, dude, all the life lessons and 
living on a boat for, you know, four months a year or whatever it was, looking back on that, like that's where like you really develop as a, as a young boy, you yeah. know? Yeah, man, that's awesome. Yeah, it was cool. That's wild. I want to take a second to talk about something near and dear to my heart. And that is a staunch supporter of this podcast, which is Bub's Naturals. Uh, the hat sitting in front of me uh, here on our coffee table here in the studio belonged to Glenn Doherty. His nickname was Bub. Uh, I did two platoons with him, and his childhood best friend uh, and another colleague of theirs, uh, Sean is the best friend, TJ is their colleague, uh, started Bub's Naturals, which is a collagen and MCT oil company uh, in Bub's or Glenn's honor. And, um, you know, for me, it's, it's uh, an absolute honor to be sponsored by and working with a company that, um, you know, was started in the honor of one of my closest friends and, and a guy that I went to war with. And, uh, you know, the, the Bubs brand is not only super quality, um, you know, collagen, uh, collagen powder as well as MCT oil powder, um, you know, but they also give back to the Glenn Doherty Memorial Foundation. Uh, they donate proceeds from their product sales to the Glenn Doherty Memorial Foundation, which, uh, you know, to me just furthers, uh, you know, the, the mission set on Veterans Day, they give 100% back. So uh, I do believe it's the best collagen on the planet. Uh, I like to mix it in with uh, morning coffee, the MCT oil powder, the same thing, uh, mixes in very easy, it tastes great. Uh, and it just kind of adds everything that you want to start your day off from a brain health standpoint, from a joint support, gut support, um, you know, MCT oil and, Collagen are, are two components, especially as as we age, uh, that are integral components to uh, to health. And so, uh, to be able to work with Bubs Naturals and uh, be able to to work with them and, and sponsor a product that uh, number one is a high quality product, and number two is is so near and dear to uh, you know to my heart and to the Mike Drop podcast for for who it uh, was started for and what it stands for. Um, you know, it's just a, it's an amazing amazing place to be. So. Um, it is whole 30 approved. Um, it's, uh, sport certified, so you're not uh, going to run into any problems with that. Um, and I will say that, um, you know, right now they're, they're offering, uh, 20%, <clears throat> 20% off if you go to bubsnaturals.com and, uh, use the mic drop code. So, uh, I really highly encourage you to, to try it out, incorporate it into your day, day to day for joint health, for brain health, uh, for cognition, for gut health. And, uh, and to support an amazing organization that does a lot of things uh, in Glenn Bub's honor. So uh, go to bubsnaturals.com. Mic drop is the code 20% off. All right, as you guys know, the lifestyle changes and the, the fast pace that we live, uh, it makes it difficult to get in, uh, you know, all of the vitamins, minerals, fruits, vegetables, et cetera. Uh, started working with First Form. Uh, it's a great company. Uh, everybody knows who they are, and, and uh, I've been trying their stuff for a while now, and I, I love it. Uh, in particular, their Opti Greens 50. It's a precisely formulated green superfood powder uh, that increases overall immune system support and digestive health. Uh, 80% of your immune system is located in your gut and digestive tract, so healthy digestion is essential for overall health and wellness. It's got 50 hand-chosen ingredients, um, and it's Taste and texture are like no other product. It's not gritty. It's got a sweet berry flavor. Uh, 100% of all the greens ingredients are grown and manufactured in the USA. Um, you know, for me, this is a, a really good one-stop shop to uh, to get all the extra stuff that you need. There's a lot of greens out there. This is uh, a product I stand behind. I take. I enjoy it, uh, and and notice a remarkable difference in uh, just overall the way that I feel. My my gut health and digestion is uh, is noticeably improved. It's a green superfood blend. It's a phytonutrient blend. Uh, it's a glycemic balance blend. It's not going to spike your, your blood sugar. It's got digestive enzyme blends and probiotics in it. It's a great product. Uh, Andy Frazella and, and First Form is a phenomenal company that uh, you know is very supportive of the veteran community. And uh, I just I can't say enough good things about him and the company. So OptiGreens 50, uh, just a, a great product. And uh, they're, they're a fantastic sponsor and supporter of Mic Drop. Before we get into your childhood, just uh, real quick, uh, your morning routine on a normal normal day that you're in town um, for the first three hours of the day. You know, I actually am not a morning guy at all. I'm the opposite of Jocko. 
<laughs> I feel uh you should take a picture of your watch when you go to bed then. Yeah, I know, like right? Fucking 2:30 a.m. You know what's funny is me and my wife are both night owls. Yeah. And it's because we still have three kids that are in school, so the mornings are always dedicated to them. Yeah. You know, we wake up, we start getting the girls ready and it's it drives me nuts because they're at an age now where they should be able to get themselves ready, I feel, yeah. but my my wife is still like picking out their clothes yeah. and get, helping them get their hair ready. But yeah, it's usually uh, it's usually just chaos at our house during the school year yeah. for the first hour, and then there we pull them from public school, so I have to drive them to school every morning, and and I'm not saying that, but like poor me, pulling them from public school was the best choice we've ever made. Yeah, no doubt. Um, but no, when when school and, and school actually ends this Thursday, and I can't wait. When school is not in session, that's when I really try and implement a good morning routine. And that involves, I like to wake up with, you know, roughly sunrise mm -hmm. and then get a walk in and, you know, all the stuff that they're finding beneficial that it, it shouldn't take Andrew Huberman doing studies to understand that walking in the morning and getting sun on your face and, and drinking a bunch of water and all that stuff is good for you. Yeah. But we've gotten away from all that stuff. Yeah. And so, and again, another, another shout out to Andy with the 75 hard, that routine it proved really beneficial for me. Yeah. That's and awesome. just start your day with water, sun and movement. Yeah. And, and I don't go to the gym and kill myself in the morning. I always tell my team, I'm not good to roll until noon or later. Yeah. I don't know how the guys fight each other at the like 5 a.m. class. Dude, I, I don't know either. I mean, I, you know, I'll usually go late morning, you know, either 11 or 12. Um, there's a, occasions where I'll do nine or 10 or whatever. And, and it, it, like every time I'm just like, fuck, this was a mistake. You know? <laughs> yeah. Every fucking time. Now, when I was a police officer at the port, there was uh, a handful of times when guys would get together and want to do morning training at like 5 a.m. Yeah. And it's like, ugh, like nothing about that makes me want to do it. But then the other side of it is just to be one of the guys and to be present yeah. and, and to be involved with training. I'd partake in some of those early sessions and it never changed. Yeah. Like, and you know, they'll joke and be like, well, you don't get to, you don't get to choose when you're going to get into a physical encounter. And it's like, yeah, okay. But I get to choose when I train though. <laughs> so so yeah. guess what? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, I'm right there with you. Speaking, uh, you mentioned Andy with 75 hard. Um, he's a sponsor of both of our shows. So big shout out to first form and Andy cause they're uh, they're great, great company. And, and like Andy always says, when he holds up the drinks on his show, this, I don't have, I don't run ads on my show. So this is not an ad. <laughs> We're just drinking first form energy. <laughs> That's classic. Andy. Are you, do you know Andy personally? I mean, I've talked to him. Um, He's actually supposed to come down uh, for the show later later this summer. But oh, dude, that's a big deal because yeah. Andy doesn't do shows. I know it. Yeah, he said he'd come down for that's it. That's cool. Uh, yeah, Andy reached out to me almost immediately after my viral video. Oh, nice. And he's like, you think how I think. Yeah. I want you on our team. Dude, and we've awesome. actually become pretty good friends over the last couple of years. And, uh, I mean – military guys that like geek out on leadership and want to understand like how to be the best leader. Andy may have never spent a minute in the military, but he's one of the best leaders I've ever known. Yeah. That's awesome. It's, I mean, you, uh, you can tell, you know, yeah, he just knows how to inspire people. Yeah. And when you inspire people and you hold people accountable, that's where the magic happens. Yeah. And dude, I mean, I went down and did his show and walked around headquarters and met like, I mean, he has like 500 people in the building at any given time. Yeah. Every single person who you shake their hands, they look at you in the eyes. They have positive energy. There's just good vibes around there. Yeah, that's you know? awesome. That's rare too. It's know? rare. Yeah. Um, and he told they were giving me a tour, and uh, it was either him or DJ's. Like, so we have 500 people that are present in in the headquarters at any given time. How many janitors do you think we would have on staff for 500 people? So what, what do you think the answer to that? Well, I'm going to go with zero is every, everybody takes care of their own shit. <laughs> so he said, yeah. he goes fucking zero. Yeah. He goes, if you're, if your garbage gets filled, take your garbage out. Yeah. If you dribble piss on the urinal, go get a paper towel and wipe it up. Yeah. Cause if you're not willing to wipe up piss on a toilet that we all share, you're not cut from our cloth. I don't want you on our team. Yeah. That's awesome. And it's like, cause dude, the, the, the federal government's the opposite. Yeah. Every organization I've ever worked from worked for has like a team of, and they're usually like Ethiopian or Somali women yeah. that just follow everybody around and clean up the lunchroom tables and vacuum and clean the bathrooms. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, you create a culture where people are being lazy, yeah. you know? 
Yeah, and that spills over into everything else. Exactly. You know? yeah. uh, Vortex is very similar. I don't know if you're friends with Seamus Terry. He's the president of Vortex. Oh, yeah. Great human being. Yeah. I was introduced to him through Sal Frisella, Andy's brother, and went up and, and spent a couple of days up at Vortex headquarters. It's the exact same culture. Yeah, that's awesome. And every day at Vortex is bring your dog to work day. No shit. So they have like <laughs> the, they have like 50 dogs in the building at that's any given wild, time. Man. It's that's cool though, fun. man. Cool companies. Yeah. That's good shit. Um, all right, so I, I would like to talk just a little bit about your childhood and kind of uh, you know where where you grew up and you know, we you talked a little bit about the uh, the fishing. Uh, where where did you grow up and and what was that like other than the uh, the long summers? So I grew up in Snohomish, Washington, which is like forty five minutes or an hour outside of Seattle to the mm-hmm. north, and uh, you know people hear about Seattle and they think of it as like this. Washington is just this liberal cesspool, but a lot of Washington is like farm communities. Yeah. And Snohomish was a farm community. Um, I didn't grow up on a farm, but we, we grew up in the suburbs and it was like normal childhood. You know, I, I don't know if I should say normal living in Alaska on a boat, yeah. but, uh, you know, my dad was a hard worker. He owned a, a transmission shop and he turned wrenches during the winter and the fall. And then he had one of his guys run the transmission shop during the spring and the summer where he was a commercial fisherman. Yeah. And so, and I also grew up, I mean, I was born in 80 and in those years, and and I don't know if this is right or wrong. It just was what it was, but like, I feel like we were the last generation to still grow up kind of hard. Agreed. You know, like, and and my dad, I never heard I love you from my dad until I was 20 years old. Oh, no shit. You know, and he wasn't a bad man, but he was hard on me. Yeah. And there was no bullshit in my house and I was afraid of him. Like, I remember when dad would come home at work at the end of the night, there'd always be something in my stomach like, oh, fuck, dude. <laughs> What'd I fuck up? Yeah, and, and like, he wasn't abusive or he never hurt me or anything like that. But he just, in Dana Anderson's house, there was no bullshit. Yeah. And and I actually think, looking back on that, it's probably a fucking good thing. No, for sure it you is. Know? I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, kind of similarly. I mean, not, not the, the dad experience. I mean, my dad was, was amazing growing up. I, I wouldn't say, I mean, I, I had a healthy respect and and there was a, a a part of fear but not it wasn't warranted yeah you know, it's kind of similar like he, he never put his hands on any of us i mean he was just this stoic like you never saw him get fucking ne- never saw him lose control of his emotions really and uh but he was just you know this you know very balanced and and stoic he was he was a wrestler he, he wrestled with dan gable in high school oh, shit. And, and, and wrestled in college and, and wrestled with him getting ready for the Olympics. And I mean, you know, he's, he's bigger than I am. He's still in good shape. Like, um, and so seeing him as like, you know, this big, strong fucking rough dude, but didn't act like it was yeah. just a cool balance, you know? And, and, um, but you know, to, to speaking to your point on the childhood though, it's like that, that was really the last decade because I was, I'm two years older than you are. Um, but that, that you could, you know, basically grow up outside. Yeah. You know, where it was yep, like, for sure. you know, right after school and all fucking summer long, it's like you're on your bike all the fucking time, yep. you know, and, and your mom has no idea where the fuck <laughs> you're at. You're drinking from a fucking a hose in the front yard and playing football and fucking building forts and setting fires and like just doing dumb shit. And, and like, the, you know, starting in the, in the nineties, mid nineties that like that just stopped happening, did. you know? No, I think about that a lot today because I remember being, I mean, 10 year old boy, and I would hop on my bike with my neighbor, Tony Carberry, and we'd be gone until the sun was going down. Yeah. And and there was, we lived in a, like the outside of Snohomish, this little town called Machias, which was between different towns. So we could take our bikes up to Lake Stevens or up to Snohomish. And th- there is no way to get a hold of me. Yeah. There's no text message. There's yeah. no pagers. Yeah, no Life 360. And, and now as a, you know, I have an 11 year old, uh, that's my middle girl. I think about her being out of touch yeah. for 10 hours. Yeah. Like almost makes me panic. Oh, I know. But times are different too, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. My dad was, uh, it was interesting how his hardness at the time, I just thought my dad was kind of a dick growing up, mm-hmm. but it was calculated. Yeah. And after I joined the military, I turned 18, I joined the military my senior year, and I was in the delayed entry program. And so I joined, you know, I probably had four or five months until I graduated and then shipped off. And he's like, bro, come downstairs. And I was like, oh, pit my stomach, right? He goes, come out to the garage. We got something to talk about. And uh, 
you know, when dad says that, it's just like, fuck, man, you know? Yeah. And he goes, listen up, bro. I know you signed up for the military. You're going to be gone here in a couple months. I just wanted to let you know I had 18 years to form you, 18 years of being your dad, and 18 years of not being your friend. He goes, but I'm ready for that to shift now. He goes, moving forward, I do want to be friends. And he put his hand out and shook my hand. Really? And in a moment in time, I'm getting a little emotional because I, I, dad ended up passing in 2015. Oh, so when I think back on this, it's kind of tough, but it's like in a moment in time, our relationship shifted. Just like that. Just like that. Yeah. And, and then after I left for boot camp and then the 9 11 happened, and he had like so much pride in what his son was doing. And then I'd come home and it was like hugs and I love you. And we ended up being like best friends Dude, for the next 15 years. What a profound moment. Yeah. Oh, and then he ended up passing when I was 35. And I remember because my mom will still apologize to me this day. She's like, I'm just so sorry. Your dad was so hard on you when you were a child. I said, mom, I'm proud of who I am today. And maybe that was necessary. Yeah. But regardless if he was out of line or not, the last 15 years, we were best friends. Yeah, that's amazing. Man. So it was fi whatever problem there was, it was fixed. Yeah. You know? Yeah, man, that's really cool. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, so you had a sister. Yep. Uh, what, what did your mom do growing up? Stay-at-home stay at home mom. Stay-at-home mom slash uh, co-pilot on the boat. Like, yeah. the crazy thing is, is like, as a commercial fisherman taking the family out there, my dad's on the back running gear. And my mom was just by default, like, Hey, you're driving the boat now. Yeah, that's awesome. And, uh, man, she, she, that was a crazy experience for her too. Cause she's like, I'm a stay at home mom. And now I'm a fucking captain of a boat yeah. fishing in the, in 20 foot seas in Alaska. Yeah. You know, that's a trip, man. <laughs> what a fucking wild way to grow up. Yeah. It was cool, man. Yeah. Uh, did you play any sports growing up? You know, I did track and wrestling through seventh, eighth and ninth grade. And man, I always liked wrestling, but you know how it is once you, it, it 10th grade, 15, 16 years old, your priority shift. Yeah. I found beer, I found girls, <laughs> and athletics pretty much disappeared from that point forward. And you know what's funny is... Uh, so you were still wrestling, but it was just drunken with women. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. To this day, to this day, it's one of my biggest life regrets. Yeah. And it's like, dude, I've, I've become a black belt in jiu-jitsu, I've fought MMA, like, I feel like I should have filled that void. But the thing is, you can never catch up to the guys that were good wrestlers when yeah. they were kids. Yeah. You know, one of my training partners, he's a purple, but one of my purple belts started wrestling at four, mm -hmm. wrestled all through school, all through college. And you, I'll never catch up to that guy. Yeah. It just is what it is. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, it's, it, I guess, similar to most sports, but I think wrestling is almost an exception that way. Swimming is very similar that way. Cause uh, I, I, I grew up swimming competitively and, and, started when I was five and, and, you know, right around that seventh and eighth grade, like I was so burnt out, you know, cause at that point it had been six, seven, eight years of fucking swimming all year round, you know, in the summer, t you know, sometimes two a day practices and whatever. And I like, I was just fucking tired of it. So I stopped, stopped swimming like part of seventh and all of eighth grade. And then in high school, you know, joined the high school team and the guys that I was either competing with or even beating in seventh grade now were just fucking schooling me oh, in, in ninth grade. You know, guys that, again, we had grown up, even, even, you know, guys within the state that like, you know, there's pockets of, of good swim clubs or whatever, they're, they're USS swim clubs that, that, you know, train year round and guys that I remember competing against at, at junior Olympics and shit like that. Now, you know, my high school team is swimming against their high school team and they're just, we're, we're not in the same fucking yeah. category. That, that 18 month period of me saying, fuck this, I'm tired of it. And them driving through like world of difference, you know, it was just fucking heartbreaking. Yeah. So was buds, the water part of buds, the easiest part for you? Uh, sort of. Um, now who's interviewing who, right? <laughs> uh, that's, 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 always, that's always what happens when you have other, other podcast hosts on, uh, sort of what's interesting is, Everything water related with the exception of the, the two mile ocean swims, I, I wouldn't say I found to be easy, but it was very manageable. Like it, it wasn't a struggle yeah. for me. Whereas a lot of guys with, you know, some of the treading, you know, the, the twin 80 treading or, um, you know, the drown proofing and, you know, the underwater swims and not tying and shit like that. It, none of it was super difficult. Whereas, you know, some guys couldn't make it because of it. Yeah. But I had spent so much time swimming with a, without fins and B, not in open water where I'm looking at a black line and I'm, I'm guiding off of a black line. Like I was so ingrained 
into swimming that way, like it, it was a, a more of a struggle than I anticipated being able to guide uh, along the coast um, because, you know, there's a curvature, there's fucking swell, there's current, there's no, no line on the ground. Like it, it, it's a skill in and of itself being able to swim in a straight fucking line in, in the ocean. Yeah. Because you've got to guide off of landmarks and not, like there's a weird sense of direction that some people are just inherently good at and, and I'm not. Bro, I, I mean, I'm very into boating. I have a yeah. big 26-foot uh, yeah, offshore same, boat. Same shit. Driving a boat in a straight line in the ocean can be difficult. Yeah. yeah. So, so let alone swim. Yeah. Man. I mean, because, you know, the thing that I think people don't don't think about in a boat, like you can see way fucking better than you can when you're in the water. I mean, your fucking eyes are two inches above yeah. above the water. Like you can't see hardly any fucking thing. So you, you yeah, anyway, uh, the, the swims were, were a struggle, and, and it was because it fucked my ankles up because I wasn't used to the, the super stiff uh, fins that we were using. Oh, okay, um, yeah. And just, you know, I, I wasn't good at guiding, and, and, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, it, like, it didn't kick me out of training, obviously, but it, it was harder than, uh, than I was expecting for sure. But, Interesting. Yeah, but... Uh, no, I'll shut up and let you interview me. No, no, all good. <laughs> uh, I mean, to me, it's it's a good back and forth for sure. But um, all right, so uh, wrestling wise, did you wrestle at all in high school? Was it just ninth nope. grade? Yeah, yeah, ninth grade, I was done. Yeah, yep. Um, w- was there a light switch moment slash catalyst for you that that made you say, "I want to join the army"? No, it was just gradual. You know, I always tell people because you know, like. You hear like Andy Stumpf and Mike Glover, they're like, I knew I wanted to be this since I was eight or whatever, you know, after you read a book or had that like moment where something inspired you. I was the opposite. I uh, I was halfway through my senior year and I hated school and all my friends are starting to look at college. And I was like, for me, and my dad, you know, he had moved from uh, commercial fishing and he bought a piece of property in Alaska and had built uh uh, fishing resort. Oh, no shit. And so he's like, bro, why don't you take the fishing resort over with me? You know? So it's like, okay, I'm either going to go into the workforce and just start running the fishing resort with my dad. But there was just something inside of me. I wanted something a little different. And this was 1999. So it was yeah. still a peacetime military. There's no war going on. But I was like, you know what? The, the fishing resort will still be there. Why don't you just go do some wild shit for a couple of years? You're not ready to settle down. You're definitely not ready to go to college. And let's just see what the military has to offer. And so, and this is, I had no reason to come to this conclusion other than I wanted to be badass. Yeah. Because I was like, well, if I'm going to do this, why don't you become an army ranger or a Navy SEAL? I didn't know anything about their mission capabilities or, or you know, what they did. But those two, those two names are associated with being badass. Yeah. And so I went to the Navy recruiter first. And the guy was just kind of a D bag, right? <laughs> and I was like, the fuck's up with the Navy? Yeah. It was so stupid. 17, 18 year old kid making a career choice based on one man yeah. well, sitting across from a table, yeah. you know? I mean, to be fair, that's a, that's, that's a recruiting fumble on the Navy's part. And in, in that, you know, that, that is a, a first impression and that's essentially the Navy's representation. Yeah, that's all you right? have to go off of. And so, and I remember this guy was like, okay, listen, this is what we're going to do. And you know, like I'm going there. This is my initial, my initial meeting with any military recruiter. And he's like, listen, I want you to take a practice test right now. And he he put me in some like cubicle where I did like, what is it? It's like a little mini ASVAB to just kind of see where you fall. He's like, okay, you did really well. I'm going to get you scheduled for MEPS on this day. And then we're going to do this. And then we're going to do this. And I'm like, man, like I'm literally just kind of putting the feelers out there trying to see you know, like what my options are. I'm not ready to go to MEPS tomorrow. Just super pushy. And I remember it rubbed me the wrong way. And you know how all the military recruiting stations are all co-located, right? So then I walk across to the army recruiter and the guy had a ranger tab. Oh, no shit. Yeah, right? And he was never in the regiment, but he had a ranger tab. And he was cool as shit. And I just vibed with this guy. And I was like, oh, this is what army guys are like. Yeah. <laughs> so here again, I'm making a decision based on one human yeah. and, uh, ended up signing up with the army based yeah. on that. Yeah. That's wild. So did you have at, at that time, was there a guarantee to go? No. To rip or, so they did have rip contracts, but like always yeah. recruiters so, are oh, like, bad well, news. unfortunately no <laughs> rip contracts are available. It's called option 40 now, which I just found out they stopped doing. Oh really? Yeah. I just, I, cause I was at the recruiter last week with one of my jujitsu students. But, uh, 
So they gave me airborne infantry and I was slotted to go to the 82nd, but I didn't want to go to the 82nd. I want to go to Ranger Regiment. And my recruiter told me this and fuck man, thank God it worked out because it doesn't, the, the needs of the regiment dictate how many people attend RIP. Yeah. And he goes, when you're down at airborne school, you can make a request to go to RIP and then they'll pull your orders from the 82nd and then you fall under the Ranger Regiment because they have the authority to do that. I said, okay. And that ended up happening. Wow. Exactly like that. That's rare. And that's rare. Yeah. Like at the time I was like, okay, I'm in airborne school. Time to, to figure out how to get into RIP. And a RIP recruiter actually came down to airborne school and said, hey, who who's interested in being an Army Ranger? And like a handful of us, oh, me. And he's like, all right, fall out, form a, form a second formation over here and took us on a death run right mm-hmm. on the, right on the spot. And, uh, that's fucking awesome. Yeah. They ended up cutting orders. I ended up attending rip. Did any of the dudes fall out? Everybody, dude, everybody fell out. No oh, shit. Every last one of us, including me. Yeah. And, uh, I rem- I found out after the fact they purposefully send send the fastest guy from regiment <laughs> yeah. to pick up the new recruits yeah, and just go fucking crush because him. because nobody his name was Sergeant Rackus he's since passed but he uh, I guess at the time I didn't know who he was he's just a guy saying who wants to be a ranger form a formation yeah. he's one of the fastest dudes at headquarters yeah. and that was that's by design that's so awesome. right out of the gates three minutes after you want to be an <clears throat> army ranger you feel like a piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, man, do I really want to fucking do this? Yeah, it's awesome. And, and the thing is, RIP at the time was only three weeks. Yeah. And when SEALs hear that, they're like, what? You, your fucking selection was only three weeks? Yeah. But the difference, I think, between going into the Ranger Regiment and going into uh, a SEAL team is our basic training is infantry-based. Yeah. And it's like, you know, I forget exactly what it was, but it's called uh, OSET, One Station Unit Training, where your boot camp, your infantry training – is all together and it ended up being uh like five or six months yeah so you're doing tactics you're taking out bunkers you're uh, reacting to fire you're learning all the basic infantryman 101 stuff then you go to rip and rip is just a gut check yeah they just kick your balls in for three weeks and see if you break and if you don't then they send you to regiment and then that's where they really trained you to be a ranger yeah and it was peacetime so they had that ability to do that bring in new guys and really put a lot of energy into them, training them up and getting them ready. Whereas now they have uh, it's called RASP. It's ranger assessment and selection phase. It's eight weeks because they want guys arriving at regiment with a better understanding of regimental SOPs. Yeah. Cause you might arrive and deploy in two weeks, yeah. you know? Yeah. So they just want the, the bare minimum to be a little higher. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which uh, battalion did you go to? Second battalion. Second. So yeah, which I was, was good because you're from. Yeah, there. I was one of those guys, and you know, like I've heard a lot of times at the at the graduation of RIP, they give you a wish list, like what battalion do you want to go to, and I've heard stories of everybody gets assigned the battalion they didn't want, and then I've also heard stories where everybody got the battalion they did want, yeah. and so I asked for second battalion, I ended up getting it. So yeah, that's cool. How far is that from where you grew up? I mean, it's an hour, two hours. Oh, yeah, about hour and forty five minutes yeah. or so. So, yeah, I got to keep my same high school girlfriend. (laughs) (laughs) That's a trip. Um, And so you were there for uh, five years. I was there for four years. years. And then I ended up going into aviation for a little bit after that. Really? Yeah. Hey, guys, I wanted to uh, talk about something that I've incorporated into my daily routine, my morning routine, that has had a remarkable impact on my life. Uh, It's called BioPro Plus. Uh, It's a non-synthetic HGH uh, treatment. And, uh, you know, every year after puberty, your HGH levels naturally drop uh, and exponentially sometimes uh, can even drop by, by 50% by the time you're 35. Uh, I train jujitsu three or four times a week. I lift three or four times a week. And BioPro Plus, uh, without question, uh, enhances my ability to train more uh, days per week, harder, recover faster, uh, enhance performance. I cannot say enough good things about this product. I've been taking it for a few months. Uh, it's, it's remarkable, and I will continue to, to do so. Um, if you want to uh, you know, perform better, look better, feel better, uh, I, I can't stress it enough. I, I've tried BioPro Plus, uh, and I encourage you to go to bioproteintech.com, uh, and if you want to get $30 off your first order, use the code MikeDrop, M-I-K-E-D-R-O-P, 
And again, that's bioproteintech.com. I cannot stress enough. This stuff has uh, been a game changer for me as I've gotten older. Uh, the, the four years that you were there, you were in uh, Ramadi for... for uh, no, no, no. Ramadi was, was as a camp. contractor. Okay. Yep. Uh, I never deployed to Iraq as a ranger, okay. only Afghanistan. Um, can you uh, kind of synopsize what that deployment was like going to Afghanistan? Um, dude, it was awesome. I actually, I look back on Afghanistan as a very fond memory. And uh, culturally, I enjoyed the Afghan people. I thought that uh, what we were doing over there, it, it felt admirable. It felt special. And so, you know, I was actually, it was my last day of ranger school was 9-11. No shit. Yeah. Wow. And so. How did that impact it? Fuck, man. So ranger school, your last day of ranger school, you're in Eglin Air Force Base, Florida, and you're, it's the swamp phase. And everybody's already completed all their patrols. Everybody's been graded. Like, you know who's going to graduate. The last day you literally wake up, put on a parachute, and they drop you back into Fort Benning. You turn your gear in, and then you go to graduation ceremony. And so we were literally rigged up, ready to get on the bird. The cadre came out and said, hey, everybody drop shoots, de-rig, put a pallet, put them back on the pallet, come in the auditorium. We have something to talk about. And you're like, we're the first class that everybody failed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Fuck. Well, no, anytime a jump is canceled, we're, yeah. we're stoked. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's how I know if people are full of shit or not about being a ranger. It's like, <laughs> Oh dude, I was a ranger. Oh yeah. Do you, do you like jumping out of planes? Like you weren't a ranger. <laughs> yeah. You weren't a ranger. <laughs> you're Fucking that. rangers hate jumping out of planes. Yeah. Cause it's the military knows how to take the fun out of everything. Yeah, for sure. And so we went to the auditorium and, they showed us the fucking planes hit the towers. Damn. And it's like, we're going to fucking war. You know, yeah. I remember one of the one of the kids said that, we're going to war. And one of the RIs, the ranger instructors, like, shut up, you guys aren't going anywhere. <laughs> Good. No, it's like, you ain't going anywhere because yeah. you're in a training billet. Yeah. We're going to war. And uh, man, we were deployed less than a month later. Wow. But the 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 thing that sucked, man, we got deployed and we were going to be part of the invasion with third ranger battalion. Mm -hmm. So you remember third ranger battalion jumped into objective Rhino and secured that airfield. Then the Marines landed and then they convoyed up and took Kandahar. We were slotted to be part of that initial jump into objective Rhino. And then like right before it went down, they're like, Hey, we've decided this is not a battalion plus size objective. And third ranger battalion is going to handle it without the second battalion attachments. Mm. And it's like, <sighs> and then we ended up not even going into country. They redeployed us back home. No shit. Cause they were, we were in, uh, Amman, Jordan. And then third battalion was in <clears throat> Qatar, I believe. And then we were both going to jump on the objective together. Yeah. And so we ended up redeploying home and then didn't back on a rotation to Afghanistan until sometime in 02. Oh, okay. And, uh, you know, like I've had two rotations in Afghanistan where we were on QRF the whole time, which on one hand kind of sucks, but on other hand, it's just a picnic too. Yeah. Cause you're just on the Kandahar airfield reading books and lifting weights and sun tanning. Yeah. Ready to whip some ass. Ready to whip some it. ass. And, you know, and we only got mobilized a handful of times for uh, downed aircrafts. Any any uh, follow on firefights from from that stuff? Nope, nothing. I never I never fired my weapon as an army ranger in Afghanistan. No shit. Yeah, that's wild. And uh, I mean, and, and dude, at the time, people were so upset about it. Like, fuck, dude, full deployment. We didn't get to kill one dude. But the thing is, it's like we all came home too. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. And so it's it's easy to to want something, but you know the saying, "I like, careful what you wish for." Yeah. And then our next deployment, we went up to Barry Kaut. Are you familiar with that area? It's way up in the Hindu Kush. It's literally like close to the Chinese border. There's oh. a little section of Afghanistan that actually has a border with China. And uh, we just did safe house operations out of this little safe house in Barry Kaut. And uh, same thing though. Like we did lots of raids. We're looking for HVTs and it was always dry hole after dry hole after dry hole. Um, there was a dev team, dev group team out there with us and they got like IED'd one day and it was kind of like, that's like the highlight the, of the deployment, you know? Yeah. And, uh, but the thing, the reason I look back on Afghanistan and find it, look back on it fondly, those deployments culturally, like learning about the people, seeing how appreciative the Afghans were for our presence. 
man, I remember we'd be on patrol and the locals would be like arguing with each other. And I'd ask our interpreter, like, man, what, what are they in conflict over? And they're like, they're arguing of who gets to cook you guys dinner tonight to show you appreciation. Oh shit. Because the, the <clears throat> Taliban, they would tell us stories about what it was like living under the Taliban reign way up there in the Hindu Kush. They said like the Taliban would roll through and be like, bring all your children out ages five and under and then mow them down with the PKM. What the fuck? Like fucked up shit like that just to control people through fear. Man. And so I remember always <clears throat> looking back on that and feeling like regardless of 9-11, you know, because a lot of people like the Taliban had nothing to do with 9-11. And okay, well, that, you have validity of that, right? But at the same time, they were an organization that... I had no issues going to war with, yeah. and I think that we should have. And the and, and it, I mean, it's frustrating that we just ended up handing it back over to oh, them. No. Yeah, I mean that that's a, a show in and of itself. But, but yeah, uh, but at the time, it felt like we were we were doing something that was improving people's lives yeah, and we're you know? doing, yeah. and it was cool. Yeah, no, that's fucking great. Um, and Afghanistan is some of the most <clears throat> beautiful country in the world. Yeah, you know, a lot of times people attribute. Afghanistan, they think it's like the same as Iraq, and it's like no, Vastly it's different. yeah, it's uh, some of the most beautiful mountainous terrain you'll ever see. Yeah, um, what was your decision making process from doing a couple of uh, pumps to Afghanistan and then deciding that you wanted to get out and be a contractor? What was the? You know, I was, I love the Ranger Regiment. Like I always looked back on that period of my life as. Uh, something that I will cherish. And, but simultaneously at the same time, there was a lot of stupid military red tape that made it hard for me to consider reenlisting. And I was like, you know what? Like, I remember one story, we were literally in the safe house for months and my platoon sergeant comes in our hooch all, all like flustered. And he's like, I just got word that Sergeant Major's on the resupply bird and he's gonna, He's going to stop by when they drop off the resupply pallets. Clean the house. Hey, yeah, everybody shave. <laughs> we don't you. have running water. Yeah. I don't give a shit. Everybody shave. And it's like, oh, okay, these are the dumb military games. Yeah. Because what, you don't have the balls as a platoon sergeant to say, hey, Sergeant Major, we literally don't have running water out here. Yeah. And like, oh, your gas mask won't seal. Okay, well, when's the last time we've been gassed by the Taliban? Yeah. And so just stupid shit like that. And then there was also something, my favorite part of being a ranger is flying around in Blackhawks. I was always fascinated by it. Yeah. And I wanted, I was like, if I'm gonna stay in the military, I'm gonna go into aviation and I'm gonna fly. And I ended up getting out and doing a couple contracts and that was still kicking around in my head. I ended up saying, you know what, fuck it, I am gonna do that. And I re-enlisted and went and became a warrant officer. And I was in flight school at Fort Rucker. And I hemorrhaged my retina doing CrossFit. Really? Yeah. What were you doing? Upside down push-ups on the wall. So your feet are against the wall and yeah. you're just doing handstand push-ups. And all the pressure in your head, it just, it ruptured a vessel in my retina, bled on the inside of my eye, and it made me go partially blind. Permanently? No. It only, you only lose vision while the blood is pooled on your retina, but they said it could take up to six months to reabsorb. And they're like, an injury like this to your eye in the pilot program, you're done. No oh, shit. And you know what? It's like, I don't know. I look back on that and I don't look at it as like necessarily as a failure because like it is what it is. But at the same time, maybe a blessing in disguise because yeah. how many fucking birds went down? Yeah. Fucking seems like all of them for a yeah, while. Yeah, you know. Fucking CrossFit. Cross, yeah, I always say CrossFit probably saved my life, dude. <laughs> but yeah, you know, the, like the getting uh, out of the Ranger Regiment was something that, even though I enjoyed the environment and I worked for what I can, and, and even that platoon sergeant, like I'm busting his balls here, but I enjoyed working for him. Yeah, you know what I mean. And uh, but I always knew like this isn't something that I want to make a career out of. And I have, you know, some of my buddies stayed in the Ranger Regiment for 15, 17 years. Mm -hmm. And I always said, if I'm going to stay in, I'm going to do something different. Yeah. Well, so did you, uh, you got out, went to Triple Canopy and then went back? Yep. Okay. Yep. I did a few deployments. The, the Triple Canopy stuff, um, I know that some of it's a little dicey in terms of what you guys can talk about. Oh, dude, I'll talk about all of it. I well, don't care. Uh, I mean, I'd love to hear your experiences there and like where you went and, and what kind of went down. Like what was some hairy shit that you got Dude, into? So 
If, I mean, if Seth was involved, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That's a fucking well, I met, I did meet Seth, and uh, fuck, it wasn't the initial triple canopy selection, but we ended up doing like a, a train up at some point. And he's like, Dude, "Let's go out drinking tonight." I'm like, "Okay," and we went out and drank Jaeger bombs until like <laughs> three in the morning, and yeah, you you can imagine how that played out. But you know, when I was getting out of the military, contracting was just was just picking up and one of my buddies was like he was in regiment with me he goes hey man i got a contact with a guy his name is matt man and i don't know if you know who that is but he's a, a cag dude that started triple canopy basically he goes he's looking for guys that are getting out of special operations units and he'll pay you up to 30k a month if you'll deploy with them you're like <laughs> what e5 <laughs> e5 to 30k yeah. a month yeah where do i sign up yeah and so they sent me an application through email. And the cool thing about Triple Canopy is they wouldn't accept applications unless you came out of special operations. Yeah, at first. At first. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so, like, man, I applied. And when I got there, I was, like, the little kid. Like, 22, 23-year-old Ranger. And then a bunch, a bunch of unit guys, a bunch of, like, older SF guys, uh, a bunch of Force Recon guys. And so I remember, I was like, all right, I just got to do what Ranger does. And that's be in good shape and be a good shooter and keep my mouth shut, my eyes open. And because that's how I conducted myself, like I was, I did exceptionally well. And went through their selection, which was, it was kind of funny, it was in West Memphis, Arkansas. And which it's just, is a beautiful place. <laughs> yeah, and it's just a bunch of unit guys kind of making up a selection yeah. for a group of civilians. Yeah. But it involved, cowboy shit. yeah, it involved PT, it involved shooting, and also like, being not being military they could fucking dx you for anything they wanted yeah so if you, if you just came across as a douchebag you you were gone you know and uh went through that selection got picked up and then they deployed me to ramadi and i didn't even know what that meant at the time and this was uh this was april of 04 and so i'm deploying to ramadi and that's right when the blackwater guys got hung from the bridge yeah. in fallujah mm-hmm and I find out Ramadi and Fallujah are basically co-located and the insurgency just bounces back and forth between those two cities just based on the op tempo. And uh, as soon as I got there, my the project manager who was a retired CAGSAR major, he goes, just so you know, it's not if, it's when here. And he goes, and I know that might sound kind of cliche, but we get hit all the fucking time. I was like, oh, okay. And since I did so many deployments without having any combat experience there was still a part of me that's like yeah right we'll see yeah and then shit man three hours later yeah yeah, seriously (laughs) like every run you'd be getting ambushed ied'd the bases were literally getting hammered by indirect like almost 24 7 because we were in a little a little outpost called uh or a little base called blue diamond which was right across the river from camp ramadi which was like the main camp there and then they had a bunch of little outposts in the cities, like I think it was like Shark Pit and Combat Outpost, where it's just a bunch of young Marines going out there and fucking dudes up every single day. Yeah. And it's like, you go into the city, you're going to get in a gunfight. And the thing is, we were, I mean, the mission of what Triple Cannon, I guess we should explain that because yeah. people listening are probably like, what the fuck were you guys even doing? So basically, after we overthrew the Saddam regime, there was a power vacuum and the Iraqis didn't even really understand how to fill that. And so U S state department put a bunch of diplomats over there to basically coach Iraqis on how to be a mayor of a city or a governor of a province. And they put these different people in power and they didn't even really understand what that job entailed. So they would have a state department diplomat and our state department diplomat was basically shadowing the new governor of Anbar province. Wow. And so if you think about it from, uh, from like, uh, Al Qaeda or from the Iraqi standpoint that did not agree with the Western government being implemented, it's like that motherfucker is target. Number one, he's the one that's starting to push a Western ideology form of government into Iraq. And so because of that, they were targeted. And that's why, I mean, we had a reputation in Ramadi. They actually called us the half beards because they all had, you know, beards down to here. And then all the U S military people 
were clean shaven yeah. and then contractors, we were the half beards yeah. and they wanted, there was bounties on our heads. Really? Yeah. And they wanted to kill the, the our principal at the time. And we can talk about it, his name is Keith kid. He ended up later becoming the ambassador. And, uh, man, when we would go out into the city, cause we were a high vis detail. There was no, it was high pro. There was no secret of where we were at and what we were doing. So because we were high profile, we would have to roll hard and be aggressive and you'd show up on venue and you could count on it within a half an hour. RPGs would get, start getting shot at the buildings, dropping indirect. They'd have snipers shooting at the, the guard posts and stuff. It was fucking nuts, man. So the, your guys' primary mission was to protect the, the placeholder. Uh, yeah. So basically government, our, our primary mission was to protect our principal. Keith kid. Okay. And that's like, anytime we were mobile, we had one battle drill. Let's break contact. Yeah. You know, you, we, we'd had a counter assault team, which I was on for a long time, but even the counter assault team, you're not going to necessarily like start firing and maneuvering and trying to take out a target. You're just going to provide a fire base while your main element can break contact. And then you fall out too. Yeah. So the, the majority of like combat that I got to see in Ramadi was fighting from rooftops. Yeah. We would be on venue and then people would start surrounding the venue. And it was fun. it was like a video game, man. We'd be in Ramadi and guys would just be starting to basically like assault the government center. And we'd be on rooftops and build bunkers and shit and just sit and wait and just fucking slam. Just slam, dude. It was well, nuts, man. How, about how many of you were there? Uh, we were 16 man team. 16. Yep. So you were you were protecting that guy the whole time? Whole time. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and also part of, I mean, that guy's duties and responsibilities would shift because state department would ask him to do different things. A lot of times we would meet with like Iraqi bankers and transfer U S like millions of dollars that are fresh off the mint. And I'm sure you saw that on deployments too. Like we were just throwing money around and, uh, some good accountability with it too. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, we used to say like, Instead of depositing this ten million dollars, yeah. and why don't the, we just leave? Why don't we just bury it yeah. with a ten-digit grid yeah. and come back in ten years? Yeah, no shit. You know, but uh, everything that we did over there was in support of the State Department mission. Okay. So, was he ever meeting with um, any guys that like were questionable? I mean, I mean, they kind of all for are, sure. But, but I mean, like, dude, guys that all the time. Yeah, and that was part of the game and trying to figure it out because you would we'd get hit sometimes in a way that it's like the only fucking way we got hit is someone knew about this meeting, yeah. you know, and you never know like what interpreter or, I mean, we even had a guy there that was, uh, we call, we used to call him Kaiser Sose because his whole job living on in the government center was he was the, like a chai boy yeah. and he'd bring us tea. Right. But he was always mumbling and like uh, 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 and like trying to talk to us. And I'd ask my interpreter, I'm like, "What's this guy saying?" And he goes, "We we don't know. He, we don't understand him either. Jeez. He's not speaking Arabic." Oh, and, I, and so, like, I remember, like, towards the end of the deployment, we're like, "I bet the chai boy is the yeah. guy <laughs> that's fucking giving out intel." You know, Dude, that's weird. Did you? I mean, where the fuck did he come from? Like, who hired him, bro? It was just a. I mean, everything that we did was. The, the main security was being ran by the locals. Oh, okay. You know, the IPs, and IPs, and that stands for Iraqi police, there's countless stories of IPs being dirty. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, pick a country, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Fucking United States. Of course. Um, what were you guys rolling in vehicle wise when you would go out? Dude, we had, uh, we had one suburban and then the rest. Up armored? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Level seven armor. And, the, you know, the windows are two and a half inches thick. And then we had a bunch of BMWs and Mercedes. The V12? Yeah, bro. Yeah. And like the crazy thing is when we were on like Route Mobile, which is the big MSR between Baghdad and Ramadi and Fallujah, we're rolling at 140. Yeah. Fuck, that, that's awesome. And dude, like. What, do you remember what tires you guys were running? We had run flats. I don't remember what tires, yeah. but yeah, I mean, we've had our tires, we had our tires shot out on multiple occasions. Yeah. And run flats, they yeah. fucking work, yeah. bro. Yeah, I know, I know it. That's fucking awesome. Uh, do you remember what, what the models were on the... I want to say the Mercedes were 700 series. And I don't remember what the 
the BMWs were. Yeah. I'm not, I know I see your car studio yeah. across the way. I know yeah. you're, uh, Zach was telling me you're a big car guy, but yeah, I, I mean, I'm just curious. I, I wasn't then like I, it's been in the last, you know, handful of years that I've kind of really gotten, gotten into cars and motorcycles, but, um, I'm always curious because that, you know, from a performance standpoint, when you're armoring a car, you know, weight, weight plays a huge role Yeah, and, and tires do too. I mean, um, I, I was, on a track here not not long ago and uh you know just the type of tire and the condition they're in the i mean the tire pressure the fucking temperature i mean all of those things play such a, a huge role when when you're doing 140 miles an hour yeah and trying to maneuver and, and whatever and so I, I was just curious but man I, we, we hit a dog one time going 140 and it literally just evaporated it evaporated like yeah. you couldn't even find it yeah but it also uh it smashed the radiator. Yeah. So the car started overheating almost instantly. And man, we had to pull over and we just left it. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's fucking that, <laughs> you know, you think yeah. about, I don't know what those cars were worth, but probably 400 grand or something. Yeah. And Hey, we're just going to leave it, yeah. you know, and Did you just blow it or just left it. No, we ended up. So as we pulled over to assess the situation, we immediately started taking fire from a, uh, a, a army Bradley unit. Because we're dark sedans pulled over on the MSR, they think we're putting in IEDs. Yeah. And I can tell you, we got shot at probably an equal amount from U.S. troops as we did the insurgency. And it's because they don't, you know, we're, we don't have uniforms. Like, even though you would think, like, we're still white guys with body armor on, it's still like, I mean, you got 18-year-old privates in, in, yeah. well, in that Well, that have been blown up fucking 30 exactly. times 100%, in a row, you know? Exactly, 100%, you know? Yeah. And so, uh, we started taking fire and, uh, like, fuck this, you know, we're leaving. So we, we just left. And then did you ever operate out there in the, in the triangle? Yeah, not really. So in all during throughout the MSR from Ramadi to Baghdad, every overpass was basically like a U.S. army outpost. Yeah. They would control the overpasses because they were actually starting to people get attacked from the overpass. So obviously it's a high ground. And so we went to the next overpass and then we stopped and pulled out flags and VS 17 panels. And we told the guys like, Hey, just so you know, that car that was just left, cause they're all in communication. Did you guys have any deconfliction comms with yes. the U S military? And yes. they're still fucking, well, it, well, here's the thing, man. Like in the early days, like we had a guy on our team, his name was a uh, Delauder and he was a force recon Marine super stud, but he had just recently retired as a, a Marine first sergeant. And he knew everybody. Yeah. So when we were deployed, we, he could just walk into the talk and be like, hey, what's up, Sergeant Major? What's up, sir? And he ended up getting us like all of the comsec that we need. He got us the radios and then the weekly comsec fills so we could be on the network with the Marines in Ramadi. But there was times when like, I remember we got in one engagement and we, we were shooting across the Euphrates River at these dudes that were straight up poster children of, of Al Qaeda Iraq. They had balaclavas on AKs. And then after the engagement was over, I saw another Marine element on the other side of the river and they started conducting a BDA. And I talked to the Marines that were with us. I was like, Hey, who are those guys? Let us know what they find. They're like, we don't know who they are. I said, we can see them. You don't know who that is. Like, no, you don't have comms with them. No. And <laughs> that was kind of like peeling back the curtain because people think like the U.S. military is this well-oiled machine, dude. War is an absolute shit show. Sometimes yeah. nobody knows what the fuck is going on. So, yeah, we we had an instance kind of like that with uh, with Marines where there was a small pocket of insurgents between us and and a fucking column of Marines that you know were both shooting at them. <laughs> yeah, know, they're, they're in between us. It was a fucking mess. But well, bro, I'll tell you one story in Ramadi. We shot these guys that we identified as enemy. And we were on a rooftop, I had a machine gun. And you know, when you're sitting on a rooftop and you're a fresh set of eyes, you're taking it all in, you see a lot more than the, the Lance Corporal that's been on the rooftop for the last three days. So we just got up on the rooftop and I was watching the sedan go back and forth. And there was a, a platoon that was engaged in an engagement on the north side of Route Michigan. And the sedan kept going back and forth and you could see them. They were loading cases of something into the trunk and then going back into the engagement. I'm like, okay, that's a, they're resupplying the insurgency. So I said, the next time that car comes out on route Michigan, we're going to take it out. And we did. And literally like 
two seconds after we stopped engaging this car, the house right behind it, a group of Marines like flowed out of the door and secured like this, this little, like, you know, just like the little backyards that they have in Iraq, which was in direct line, which was the direct backdrop of us shooting this car. And my stomach kind of sank. Cause I was like, fuck man, if, if that worked out, uh, five seconds differently, yeah. we could have killed some Marines today. Yeah. You know, and it makes yeah. you realize how dangerous the 360 degree battlefield is. Yeah. But then when we did the BD on that car, it was loaded with RPGs. No oh, shit. We were right. Wow. You know, fucking dicey. But it's like even doing the right thing, some fucked up shit can happen. Yeah. You know, what, what were you guys rolling armament wise most of the time? Like, what were you, what were you rocking gear wise? Um, I mean, we just had, I forget what the, the paraclete body armor was or whatever, but that was it. I mean, yep. uh, weapon wise. Oh, okay. We were, like what was your loadout? So initially, and this is the contractor world. We show up and I got there early enough where they said our weapons got hemmed up in customs. <laughs> so we don't have, we don't have our ARs. Triple canopy issued us all AR 15s and Glock 19s. And then when we got in country, they said, none of those guns are available. We're not sure when they're going to be. So they procured AK-47s off of the local market. Wow. And that's what we ran with for like the first two months. Damn. And I fucking hate AK-47s to this day. People, that's the best gun ever made. Not the ones we had. Yeah. Absolute dog shit. If you're getting like the Yugoslavian M92 crank, you know, well-made ones, they're fucking great guns. But yeah, the, the stamped bullshit yeah. that's over there is fucking terrible. And so it was fucking dicey for a while because it's like, not only are we in a hornet's nest, but my gun only works about 50% of the time. Well, there's at least a lot of ammo laying around. Yeah. Yeah, yeah man, that's wild. Um, is there a, a story um, during your time as a contractor that stands out uh, or even a couple of them that were just like textbook shit out of a movie? Bro, yeah, August 10th ambush. August 10th, 2004. It did feel like a movie. It felt like you remember that scene in Clear and Present Danger, where yeah. they're all up on the rooftops and the motorcades rolling through, and they just fucking hammered them. Mm -hmm. We ended up getting intel. We were on venue down at the the government center, downtown Ramadi, and we got intel. Someone came off of the street and said, "Hey, the insurgency says today is the day the half beards die. They're killing all of you." And we're like, oh, "Okay, let's go." You know. So as we're leaving. We realized very quickly that, man, they put a lot of effort into this because they started funneling us by putting like Jersey barriers. Like, I don't know if they got fucking excavators out there or what, but they literally were blocking major roadways and forcing us. So you take, you take one right turn that is not part of our fucking, our route plan because we're being dictated. Our movement's now being dictated. You know, that's a, that only goes from bad to worse. Yeah. So we took one turn. It's like, and the guy up front, he was uh, like a, a unit guy and a retired SF guy, very sharp, savvy, tactical dudes. So they're already, they're like, hey, this, you know, we're already, our route's now being dictated. We're going to look for, to get on our secondary or tertiary route as soon as possible. Then there was another thing of Jersey barriers that wanted to force another right-hand turn. And they're like, fuck this, we're reversing out. Like, we'll go back on venue and figure this out. So as we're reversing out, if we'd went another 40 meters, it would have been the clear and present ambush. Wow. They were all on the rooftops on two buildings on either side, ready to just fucking hammer us. And like, they could see us, that we put together their plan and they're like, oh fuck, cat's out of the bag. So then they started shooting at us from there. And bro, every car just got riddled with gunfire one of the rpgs blew the gas tank out of our limo the limo is the car that the principal is in our protectee it went, <laughs> it went down it detonated on the ground and blew the gas tank up and unlike the movies where it's just this dramatic explosion Ball of fire. bro it was just whoosh, just liquid gas just dumped all over the road it didn't even ignite no shit yeah damn and so we reversed out and limped and now the cars are all running on their run flats and we ended up just driving on the sidewalks. It's like we're not, nothing's yeah. off fucking limits now, yeah. you know, and limped our way back to blue diamond. And it's like, dude, 
every car is fucking shot. Some of the cars even got penetrated. Like we learned a lesson is that the windows are actually the most secure part of the armored cars. Like the seams and some of the metal part portions of the cars, rounds actually impact or penetrated through. Mm. And one of them was lodged in the headrest in the car that like our AIC was sitting in, Damn. which was the car the limo or the principal was in as well. And so, but the thing is, we kept getting in these fucked up ambushes like this, but no one was getting hurt. That's amazing. And we're just like, dude, you start to get like a God complex. Yeah. We started to think we were immortal, you yeah. know? And we did that. We did that for fuck a year and a half. And then right when Blackwater bought that contract, cause that's how the, that's how the contracting world started to evolve is instead of the most capable men, it goes to the lowest bidder. Yeah. And then Blackwater started taking over and they underbid triple canopy. They won that contract and guys on that team got killed within like a, the first couple of weeks out there. Man. Was yeah. it caliber of dudes biggest contributing factor or what? Uh... I think so. Yeah. And I don't, I don't even necessarily say that pejoratively because a lot of the black water guys were solid fucking dudes. Yeah. There were some, there was a lot of great people that worked for that organization, but it gets a bad rap because they also allowed a few douchebags to slip through. And then you know how that goes, Yeah, you know? Yeah, it only takes one. It only takes one. Something and then the whole organization takes a hit, yeah. you know? Yeah. When uh, when you guys would get in these crazy ambushes, you said that uh, kind of the, the MO was breaking contact and just bagging ass. Were there instances where it was like close up enough to where you, when you were breaking contact, you're smoking dudes and then getting out? Or was it pretty pot shot kind of? A, a couple times it was, but primarily, because here's the thing, I mean, Unless it was like on August 10th, yeah, we're cracking seals and we're fucking engaging back because you had no choice. We have no choice. And we also, our principle is under direct fire. That's our mission, right? Mm -hmm. But typically the SOP is you keep the car sealed up because 308 rounds didn't penetrate those cars. Yeah. And so it's like, we're not going to fight back unless we have to. We're just going to run away. Yeah. Did you guys have any cool fucking James Bond shit where you're, Blowing smoke or oil slicks or any any kind of fucking fun shit like <laughs> no. that. I mean, can you lie about it and just, yeah. <laughs> just make something yeah. up on the fly? Um, yeah, we had these fucking armor piercing fucking yeah. No, I wish tire spikes <laughs> that shot out of the fucking headlight. <laughs> uh, there should be more of that shit. I'm just saying, you know, know like right? the U.S. military, like you have the money and the fucking engineer, the tech, like why not fucking sexy it up and make some some cool movie shit like that? Exactly. I don't know it's not like you wouldn't use it. Uh huh. I mean, for vehicles especially, like. Imagine a rear bumper that drops a fucking spike strip. <laughs> yeah. Like that would be useful. No, they have uh fuck. There's some of those like super high end. I think they're used in South Africa quite a bit. <clears throat> yeah. And they're like security cars that do have some of those. Yeah. Yeah. You push a button and it like shoots flames at people. Yeah, why and not? Shit. <laughs> why not? Um, yeah. I mean, I'm all for it. Fuck. I, I would have it if, if you could as a civilian. You know, uh, the, the contracting world was wild, but I loved it. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I knew so many guys that, you know, because I was in from 96 to the end of 08. And during that period of, like, guys that I served with that got out, I mean, you know, so I, yeah, I kind of saw. Yeah, were doing it. Yeah, I saw the evolution of how it started and, and it evolved. And, you know, and then when I got out, the first few years of doing dog contracts for some of the companies and, and intermingling with a lot of the guys that I, I was either working contracts with dog related wise or whatever we're, we're all kind of woven into that yeah that uh you know culture or, or subculture of of the contracting industry and, and uh, yeah it's fascinating shit and, and it was it was like it's kind of the, the wild west in in all of the best ways you yeah know? Uh, yep. the, the one downside it seemed and I'm, and I'm speaking a little out of turn in terms of you know i, I never technically was a contractor overseas uh, for stuff like that. But, uh, so many guys that the issue was not having the cavalry if you needed them. Yeah. And then just like the life insurance kind of stuff that, mm -hmm. that was seemed to plague a lot of the companies and, and really leave a bad taste in a lot of dudes mouths. But, and, and that one thing that really each, each contract was very different because wherever you were based, it was up to you to basically build rapport yeah. with the surrounding military capabilities and it got to the point with us where like 
us and the Marines were so close out there that like we could use our QRF assets. If they needed something from us, we were happy to help them. That's awesome. A lot of places there was like, it was a dick measuring contest between contractors and active yeah. duty. And there was a lot of like animosity. It's like, uh, like the, the movie scene scenario of Tommy Lee Jones showing up like, this is my fucking yeah, exactly. jurisdiction. Yeah, like yeah. that kind of yep. fucking dickweed, uh, protocols. Yeah. I fucking hate that shit. Um, so you did that for a period of time. What what made you decide? Okay, I'm done doing this, and I want to try the the aviation stuff. Was, so like, did you just get sick of doing it? That was right in the middle of contracting. It wasn't that I got sick of it. I still enjoyed contracting, but I felt that it only it didn't have longevity. Yeah, I was like, I don't know how long. Because remember, like when the wars first kicked off especially in Ranger Regiment, we thought it was going to be like another Panama or Grenada. Yeah. We're in and out. Or even a Somalia where they, I think it was like six months or something. Mm -hmm. And so as I was contracting, I started thinking like, you know, like I like this and this is fun, but there's probably not a lot of longevity in it. Whereas if I go to aviation, regardless if I stay in the military or not, I'm going to have lots of options. Yeah. And so I did that. It ended up not working out. And I went right back to contracting. Oh, no. I literally, it's, it's actually funny. I literally flew out of uh, Dothan, Alabama, which is where Fort Rucker's located, to Iraq. No shit. Because once they told me, hey, you're getting med dropped, I started calling and sending emails to my old team. Say, hey, do you have any yeah. openings? And they said, actually, if you're ready to deploy right now, we have an opening. So you, you showed up back in Iraq with a bloodshot eye. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was my left eye, though. Still, still non, shit in fucking non, army chat. Yeah, non-dominant eye. Yeah, that's wild, um, man. Yeah, and then I ended up contracting until 2009, and I was deployed. I, I can't really call this a deployment because we were in Erbil. Have you ever been to Erbil? No, no. It's, it's basically like being stateside. Yeah. You can go to the mall. You can go to the go-kart track and race cars. Yeah, like. Yeah. Fucking uh, Burger King. Yep, exactly. Way up north in Kurdistan, it yeah. was not Iraq. Yeah. But that was the deployment that I was on because if you have diplomats, it doesn't matter if you're in the, the peaceful areas of Iraq, they still have security teams attached to them. Yeah. And so, and, and that was like the good gigs. Yeah. Oh, you got her beal? What the fuck, dude? Yeah. It's like the vacation. Yeah. yeah. Same daily rate? No, it was a little less. Yeah. It, but, but I don't think it was a little less based on... Um, threat level that was just the nature of contracting yeah. you know we started at 760 a day if you were in a leadership position it was a k a day and then it became 600 a day and then it was 550 a day and then it's like it's almost not worth being deployed for 500 bucks a day yeah <laughs> you know well and and at that time i mean there were stateside gigs that were paying that exactly you know? so you like know? i mean i did one uh that paid on paid 450 a day um as i was transitioning out uh, in Arkansas, yeah, you know, train, like just training fucking army dudes how to shoot. And I mean, it was like, and so that was one of the deciding factors. It's like, this is 500 a day, but it's in her Yeah. Which is weird. Cause I guess you're willing to get killed for 700 a day, but not 500 <laughs> a day, <laughs> but Money it was money talk. Yeah, exactly. It was about halfway through the deployment and, uh, the, the younger guys listening won't even know what this is, but do you remember Yahoo messenger on, oh, your, yeah. on your laptop? Yeah. I got a little doo -doo -doo ding a little notification popped up and it was a uh, positive pregnancy test from my wife. Oh, no shit. So you're like fucking game changer. And I said, well, that's weird because I've been deployed for 10 months. Like, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I was told that you have to pull the plug on this thing. And I said, sir, if you remember of what I said in the video, I literally said, you have to be willing to lose your job as a police officer to stand up and be on the side of right. <laughs>